Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop here at chess.com. And I'm bringing an edition of today's Grandmaster specifically for a YouTube viewer featuring Valery Salov. And who is Valery Salov? Well, he was born on May 26th, 1964. He's a Russian Grandmaster who was actually ranked number three in the world back in 1995. His rating at the time was 2715. And uh, he became a Grandmaster in 1986. Solov was the under-17 world champion in 1980. In 1994, he won both the 16-player Tilburg knockout event, as well as the thematic Pologaevsky 60th birthday tournament in Buenos Aires. He defeated Anatoly Karpov with both colors in that event. In 2009, at the Chigorin Chess Club in St. Petersburg, Salov delivered some lectures in which he took up the role of a current chess outsider in order to critique the previous decade of chess. In particular, he discussed the problems raised by the increasing role of computers in chess opening preparation and the prospects for dealing with such problems by the means of a shift from traditional chess to Fisher Random. In a long May 2015 interview with Chess News, he touched on a number of subjects, in particular how, for various reasons, he was forced out of competitive chess due to a lack of invitations, get on the wrong side of somebody, and you just won't be invited to tournaments, and we're not sure exactly uh, what led to his um, disenfranchisement with certain sponsors, but whatever it was, it actually worked out for his good and for his better. Anyway, we're going to show some of his games, the first of which against Nigel Short, who certainly needs no real introduction. Nigel Short, born on June 1st, 1965. Of course, a tremendous grandmaster from England, a columnist, a coach, a commentator. And he has been the FIDE director for chess development since September of 2022. He became a grandmaster at the age of 19. And he also reached number three in the world of FIDE rankings. He held that for a whole year from July 1988 to 1989. In 1993, he became the first English chess player to ever play a world championship match, at least the first one officially. And that was when he qualified to play Garry Kasparov in the world championship a lot of controversy surrounding that wasn't there that's where gary kasparov and nigel short split off from fee day to form the pca because fee day was trying to be uh overly dictatorial and tyrannical in their control of the world championship match well that match was won by gary 12 and a half to seven and a half. But uh, it doesn't change Nigel Short's great accomplishment. His peak rating was 2712 back in 2004. In this game, Salov begins with a D4 opening, and Nigel Short employs the so-called Horvitz defense. Of course, that is named for Bernhard Horvitz, who lived from 1807 to 1885. Horvitz was a German first and then became a British chess master. 
Of course, he was also a writer and composer. And he should not be confused with Daniel Harvitz, who was one of his contemporaries. He was also a German chess master. Anyway, the main purpose of Horvitz's defense here is to transpose to a mainline opening without immediately committing to anything. And in this situation, c4 was played. After c4, Nigel Short played f5, which is now the Dutch defense, the classical variation, to be specific, this stakes a claim to the e4 square and envisions an attack in the middle game on the white king's side. However, obviously, as you can plainly see, it also weakens his own king's side to some degree, especially and particularly along the e8, h5 diagonal. g3 by Salov. The um, playing for the um, thin keto variation. Knight f6, which is your classical variation. Bishop g2, bishop e7, knight f3. And both sides. Castle bringing us to Ilyan Genevsky's variation, and that's named for Alexander Ilyan Genevsky, who was a Soviet chess master and organizer, in fact, one of the founders of the so called Soviet chess school. Now d5 transposes to the stonewall variation. Quite a solid but um, inflexible defense because these central pawns get more or less fixed in place. It is playable for black, but very static and not played very often at this high level. But it is played here. And b3 by Salov is Botvinnik's variation, of course, named for the sixth world chess champion, Mikhail Botvinnik, uh, who you should know is from the Soviet Union. Botvinnik uh, was still of the era where you might have, as a chess professional, you might not be fully chess professional, you might have another occupation. And he did. He was an electrical engineer and a computer scientist. In fact, he was a pioneer in computer chess. Budvinik was the first world-class player to develop within the Soviet Union. He also played a major role in the organization of chess, making significant contribution to the design of the world championship system after World War II, a design that no doubt facilitated his retention of the title for so long. Well, anyway, he was certainly contributory to what enabled the Soviet Union to dominate top-level chess in that era of time. But Vinik's pupils include World champions Anatoly Karpov, Garry Kasparov, and Vladimir Kramnik. Now, pawn c6 by Nigel Short and bishop a3. And here, Nigel leaves the opening book playing bishop to d7. The green arrow indicates the annotator's top choice and also the book move. The ECO has bishop takes the bishop, knight takes the bishop, and queen e7. Um, another line that can be played is queen's knight to d7, also a book line, with bishop takes bishop, 
Queen takes bishop and queen's knight to d2 here. Let's go back. In this game, Nigel Short with bishop d7. Queen c1. More common is to go ahead and trade that bishop with queen takes and, and the aforementioned queen's knight to d2. But here, queen c1 and bishop e8, a very common approach to liberating this bishop in a Dutch as well as a French defense setup. Now bishop takes bishop and queen takes bishop were played. Queen a3 addressing its counterpart, and the queens likewise are traded off. A5 by Nigel Short, knight e5 occupying this void in the center. Queen's knight to d7 is played at last, and white retreats his knight to d3. Now bishop h5, finally getting his last minor piece, some play. And we have quite an equal position, don't we? King's rook to e1, helping this pawn. Pawn g5. Queen's rook to c1, no doubt desiring to open the c file for this rook. Knight to e4. Pawn f3, kicking the knight away. That knight retreats to d6. And then rather than open the file, we have c5 hitting this knight. He retreats again to f7 on f4. Now king's rook to e8. Bishop f3, knight f6 defending the bishop. Rook c2, yes, knight c2 would be wise. Get this knight back into some action somehow. Very congested position, very difficult position to play, very drawish. Rook c2 was played. Here, rook e7, pawn takes pawn is a superior option here. Pawn takes pawn would be answered by pawn takes pawn, and then um, bishop to g4, no doubt, would be played. Going back, rook e7 was Nigel Short's choice. Knight b1 finally trying to redirect this knight to some kind of activity. Bishop takes the bishop, pawn takes the bishop, and we have an open file with a backward pawn, giving white his first real glimpse of any kind of target that he might hope to exploit. Here g4 is played rather than taking, although taking does make sense. I could see why he might resist, because after knight takes, you're adding perhaps another attacker here that might be hard to defend against, although that knight really is keeping this pawn from pushing forward. So it's it, both moves have advantages and disadvantages, don't they? Pawn takes the pawn, and here we get a question mark from the annotation bot uh, with a4 being preferred. To me, I thought, okay, let's finish getting this knight back in the game. It might be a bit more wild, but it certainly should be of interest and sh certainly should be considered. I get a question mark for this move, but the eval bar is uh, no more worse for the wear here. If g takes f3, king f2, 
And if knight e4 check, um, king takes the pawn. And this knight is ready to come to a4 and b6. For example, if king g7 and etc. It doesn't like my plan at all. Doesn't like my idea even in the slightest. But the eval bar is dead center, so it can't be that bad. Let's go back. In the game, pawn takes g4 was played with pawn j takes g4. Now the rooks are doubled against this backward e man, and Nigel Short answers in kind, doubling his own rooks. Knight a3 here. Knight h6. Knight c2. Knight f5. Knight f2. Pawn h5. King g2. King f7. Rook d1. Knight h7. Knight e3, putting the question to his counterpart. That question is answered with king f6, pawn h3, pawn takes pawn check, king takes pawn. Now knight f8, king g2, knight g6. Knight h3, king g7, a lot of grandmaster dancing going around, but we will see this knight come here and these rooks doubled, won't we, in due time. Oh, I see, the rook's busy defending this knight. Well, white plays king f3, now rook to f8. h4 was my choice here as indicated also by the green arrow. But uh, Eval Bar still saying it's equal, however. King f8 and knight takes knight check. Rook takes the knight. And now we double those rooks back up on that backward pawn. And we're hoping for knight g5. Get three attackers there. King f6, pawn a3, rook e8, rook e3. And I liked playing b4 here right away. But rook b3, or e3, rook back to e7, now pawn b4. Pawn takes pawn, and pawn takes pawn. And the eval bar has been creeping up ever so slightly over the last 10 moves or so. Um, giving white a glimmer of hope. Rook e8, and he played rook from e1 to e2. Either rook to e2 should be fine, I would think, that it makes no difference. I get a star. But um, sell off with rook 1e2. Rook back to e7, short just saying, uh, you're going to have to prove this as a win, and he's moving back and forth. So b5 should be considered here. Uh, for both sides, to be honest. <laughs> oh, no, you can't play b5 for, for black. But white can play b5. He didn't. He played rook e1. But I don't see why I can't play b5 right here. At this juncture, he'd have to just go right back to rook e8, wouldn't he? And then I could play pawn b6. But rook e1 does also get a star. And rook back to e8. And now, ironically, this is a blunder. 
moving the eval bar back to the center. One move late. You say, well, what is the diff? Well, now on captures, and he moved his rook right back up to e2. And b4, now back to e1. Well, the best fighting chance for black is e5. He played rook back to e7. So their, their grandmaster dancing is kind of um, costing them here. e5, a more fighting move. Rook b3, and now e5 comes late to the party. King g7 preferred. Rook takes the b man, and e takes the f man. Note that if king f7, we will play d takes the e man. And after knight takes the e man check, we'd have to play king g2. Not rook takes the e man, obviously. On rook takes the e man, we're losing a rook for the knight. I, I said E-man, I meant knight. I can play this, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm lost. Well, it has me equal. Yeah, I guess it is equal. Rook E7. And um, I'm actually equal. I can, I can uh, mark that as an equal sign. But nonetheless, I've got winning chances with king g2 i still have i still have a lot of fight here that give me opportunities with uh, king g2 that i don't have on the other line well in that line and and none of this was played keep in mind uh e takes f4 was played in this line knight c6 hitting the rook and the rook, so rook takes rook, knight takes rook, knight g5 check. Or knight takes b7 might also be okay here. I mean, rook takes b7 might also be okay. So that if king f7. What was played by Nigel Short gets a star, pawn takes the f man. Rook b6 check, king f7 here, and rook takes rook check, knight takes rook. Now knight takes the f man. You do not want to take this with the pawn, and then rook f6 equalizes. So knight takes is the most active way to play this. Knight c6, rook takes the pawn check, king e8. King e3, breaking the pin, and also black has to beware of rook g7. Rook g5, both hits the pawn and prevents rook g7. Knight e2 defends the pawn. Rook g4 super attacking this pawn. It is super defended. Now rook h7 getting behind the h man. Rook e4 check is ill-advised king d3 now knight b4 check and king d2 knight returns to c6 to renew the super attack on the d man so he just comes back to d3 now in my mind he should just go ahead and try rook takes pawn and allow knight takes d4 
on rook takes pawn knight takes pawn knight takes the knight rook takes the knight with check i've got myself one extra pawn here and have some hopes one of which is already near promotion so just getting out of check and i've got some winning chances lurking um it was move 59 so back to d3 and back to b4 I'm not sure what the time control was but it's very common for grandmasters to do some repetitions to increment the move counter to satisfy that time control well here king c3 says i'm not looking for a repetition knight c6 now rook h6 do not take the pawn obviously i hope that's obvious because then rook takes and even so you're picking up this pawn this is going to be a draw at best after king c4 and takes let's go back rook h6 is the move knight e7 now i did think trading knights was a better defense for black instead of knight d7 what did he get for knight e7 he got a star so maybe i'm wrong i thought rook takes knight should be a better way to hold here because after rook takes knight you have that that um check so just my thought knight e7 was played knight f4 rook e3 check now king b4 and surely c6 will win here although the bot doesn't like this move but rook takes pawn and c6 is definitely played getting an exclam from the bot i will point out that you do not want to grab this pawn with either the knight or the rook uh, because after knight takes you know the rook gets behind and that's likely drawn and then rook takes we'd see this knight come back with check it's not liked by the bot but the point now is on king b5 maybe you could have played king a4 we'll look at that in a moment on king b5 knight takes d4 check king b6 and rook b3 check is what i had in my mind and this should draw after rook f3 hitting this knight this should be a draw this should be a straightforward draw let's go back uh if not king b5 maybe king a4 either way knight takes uh, d4 is going to be played and on knight takes d5 well now king d7 and that should draw so do not take the h man c6 is the move that gets the x clam and gives white his best winning chances rook g4 was played rook h8 check again don't be grabbing that pawn because that's going to be captured with check and after king c5 rook c4 check and that will surely draw so rook h8 check king f7 rook h7 check king back to e8 pawn c7 now rook takes the knight and of course the only thing keeping me from promoting is this knight 
So remove the defender and do so with tempo. Rook takes knight. Check. Double exclam. That will end it. King takes the rook. Pawn promotes to a queen. That's going to be all she wrote. It's just a matter of time and technique at this level. I will grant that a queen against a rook is not the easiest win in the world for we amateurs, but grandmasters, um, well, this should be a win for white now. The game goes on for quite a long time more. But I do believe it technically should be a matter of time and technique. So we get... Rook takes pawn check, king b5, threatening queen c5, so rook e4, but here queen f5, rook e6, now queen takes the h-man, d4, queen h4 check, king f7, King c5, pawn d3, queen h7 check, king f6, and now the pawn is captured, king e7, queen g3, rook f6, queen g4, rook e6, queen g7 check, King e8, king d5, rook b6, queen c7, rook g6, king e5, king f8, king f5, rook g7, queen d8, check, king f7, queen h8, rook g2, queen f6, check. King g8, queen c6, rook g1, king f6, and yeah, if you can get queen a8 check in here, that will take care of that. Rook g7, queen a8 check, and surely the eval bar says, it's mate in eight. King h7, queen e8. This is a technique that we all know now. Rook a7, queen h5, check. King g8, queen g4, check. Uh, did he miss a, a move somewhere? Yeah, this is the way I learned was, was over here, but... Okay, this is fine. Queen eight, King h7, queen h3, check. Eventually, he's going to fork that king and that rook. King g8, queen g3, check. King h7, uh, queen h2, check. And right, now it's a fork on the next turn. King g8, queen b8, check. And after this, Nigel Short goes ahead and moves into the corner and allows the checkmate on move 98. Quite a marathon game and quite a textbook instructional end game there that the players put on for us to show how to win with a king and a queen against a king and a rook. That was good sportsmanship of Nigel Short. Plus, I mean, even at the grandmaster level, I've seen it blown and drawn before, so... It's not like it was totally um, unreasonable to play on. But uh, in the end, once you got to this back position right here, this is where you know you've got him. And um, the, the rest of these moves, th these last 10 moves, were for our benefit by these players, and we thank them for that. All right. Until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.